Tim, and welcome back to Watches Live. Can you believe it's been a week? Tonight, in the chat box, if you are joining us from around the world, Claudio and Jason from our regular team will be manning the chat box, helping with price, answering your questions, and helping to facilitate when I'm active on the table with the watches. Of course, we have only a few hours left in our November watch giveaway. We're giving away the Tudor Black Rose, the discontinued Heritage Black Bay Black. You have a chance to win the reference 79220N, but only for a few more hours in the month of November. We are going to be picking a winner shortly. You gotta be in it to win it. Welcome to everyone joining us. Eric Cecil from New York City, you are first. Mark S, you are second. I wanna remind you guys, Jason and Claudio are in the chat box. They're answering questions about price, anything about the watches you see here, and generally just keeping the chat rolling while I'm facilitating. Let's start with something complicated. In fact, let's start with two very complicated watches. From IWC and Jager LeCoult, we have two Tourbillon timepieces, and they're done in their respective brands distinctive fashion. Now IWC was late to the Tourbillon game. This, the reference 5042 Portuguese Tourbillon Mystère, was their first Tourbillon watch back in 2004, so they decided they were going to go with a flying Tourbillon. No upper bridge to block your view of the Tourbillon carriage. It's a tri-spoke with a blued overcoil hairspring, and it beats away at a quirky 19,800 vibration per hour rate. Now this is a seven-day power reserve. It is an automatic winder, and it does have an exquisite Ardoise sunburn first dial. So this is really the best of all possible worlds. It's a Portuguese, it's a tourbillon, it's a long power reserve, cognizant of the fact that this might not be an everyday watch for everyone. So you can put this one down for a week, pick it up, and it's still beating. Let's quickly go to the case back shot. You can see that it has a lot in common with the other IWC 50,000 series movements. Oversized mainspring barrel, partially skeletonized bridge. This one, not quite as exciting on the case back because all the action's on the dial side. This is a wonderful piece that is tank tough. It's as tough as an IWC big pilot in terms of the movement, but it's as fine as any Portuguese, truly an oversized dress watch. JLC has its own take on this unique oversized dress watch complication genre. And that is the 2009 Master Grand Tradition Tourbillon Contiem Perpetuel. This is a tourbillon with a unique double-stepped dial. Now, the lower portion of that dial with the Clou de Paris cut, that's actually part of the movement. It gives you an incredible crosswise view of the tourbillon carriage, and I'm going to try to show that to best effect right there. But then IWC making another appearance. This is the Kurt Klaus Perpetual Calendar Module on a ruthenium-coated dial. You can see that it's a fully coordinated, mechanically programmed perpetual calendar. All you have to do is actuate the pusher on the side, and everything moves in sync. You don't have to do any math. It even calculates the moon phase for you. This is a 42. I find this more wearable than the 44 millimeter IWC. And on the case back, as with the IWC, there's not quite as much going on. Although in JLC's case, they do make it more interesting. And this is a full platinum timepiece. Let's see if we can get that one in focus. This is a full platinum timepiece with a guilloche cut winding mass. Interesting on both sides. I particularly like the Cote de Soleil or the sunburst Cote de Genève radiating out from the balance and the tourbillon. But I will mention, and, and this is one of the coolest things about the world of watches, sometimes you can cut the corner. By the way, my Zinni's EM, I whacked it against a metal door frame before the show. Not even a dent, not even a scratch. So you can have a tourbillon, or it, let's, let's go apples to apples. You can have a, a flying tourbillon, or you can have an open escapement. And in about 2003, Terry Nataf, in his one lasting legacy, the one thing he did right at Zenith was the creation of the open escapement. Now, chocolate dial, triple Gaudron bezel, El Primero Chronomaster XXT open power reserve on the left of your screen. Now, on the right, the IWC tourbillon. Now, if we can get real close to the open dial of the Zenith, you can see the third wheel, the fourth wheel with its extended pinion forming the tri-spoke of the seconds. You can see the palette, you can see the lever, you can see the balance and the hairspring. You really do get 90% of the intrigue of a tourbillon for 10% of the price. This watch right here, $4,000 with the open El Primero escapement. And the IWC, well, that's more like $45,000. So depending on what your budget is, you can get an impressive watch from an impressive brand either way with no compromise. And they're about the same size too. 45 versus 44 and you can barely tell the difference. I'm gonna throw them on the wrist real quick. Welcome friends from around the world. I can see Alan L is joining us from Ohio. Ray Bonafon from Maine. 
Alexander O oh, joining from Melbourne, Australia, and I can see right here greetings from the UK. John Smith, thank you and greetings. And the venerable Shashir Weber fan sounding off. Eric Kelly from Indianapolis, and Eddie Landsberg, longtime fan and a regular in our chat boxes. Brandon, welcome from Boston. Okay, let's throw the IWC on the wrist. Now this is a monster, and it's one of 250 made. This is, for those keeping score, the 504207, 44 millimeters in diameter. That's on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist. The thing about this and almost every Portuguese complication is that it's flat in relation to its width. This is right about the edge of what I can wear on my wrist. Here's the thing, the Zenith is a Houdini, and I'm gonna show you why. Because the Zenith can fit where it really shouldn't. First of all, I'm dying over this watch. This reminds me of the Zenith that actually led me to fall in love with Zenith back in the mid 2000s. That was a black dial version of the same watch. I actually prefer this chocolate dial version a bit warmer. It's shorter lug to lug than the Portuguese and it's easier to wear. It's also flatter and it sits more flush. This is a watch that's oversized and wears two three millimeters smaller than it really is. That's a 45 but it wears on my wrist like a 42. I would wear that every day. It's big but it's not too big. Now let's jump real quick to a watch that is smaller and just as animated. We talk about watches that are expressive and few are more so than a foudroyant. And Chichard Lecoult with the dual met Cantiem Lunaire, 40.5 millimeters with domed bezel. This was the post-2012 version of the watch, and there's a lot going on here. Rose gold hands for the time, there's an engraved moon face, and a radial date around it. There's a foudroyant, one-sixth of a second hand, and then there's a central seconds hand. There are two power reserves, one for the balance and one for all of the indications of the dial. So you have one power reserve, 50 hours, and a second power reserve, and the result is that you can run this power-intensive complication set all day long with no loss of balance amplitude and it has a trick hacking second system zero reset seconds so you can reset both the foudroyant and the seconds hand setting this watch to the sixth of a second against a reference time chronometry was the focus on this the second of the dual met series after the chronograph the idea here is to deliver chronometer grade performance 24 hours a day and with no loss of amplitude on the balance or beauty about the movement or complication about the watch this is the 40 0.5 millimeter case and you can see it has that same Cote de Soleil that you saw on the automatic winding tourbillon perpetual calendar but here you can see it unencumbered by a rotor that's why and I'm going to emphasize this I always prepare and well I prefer a manual winder and I prepare to have both of them visible so you can see the difference in visibility between a manual wind and an automatic wind you can also see the difference between the silvered rhodium plated brass of a traditional Swiss movement and a pocket watch inspired homage to the 19th century with unplated German silver. That's what you're looking at. And since we're not in Germany, we're going to call it Maischur, the French term for nickel copper zinc. That's a sensational watch. If I had to pick between them, I'd go with the Duomet 10 times out of 10. As much as I like that tourbillon, that Duomet just kills me. What a watch. That said, you don't need complication to zing the moon face. And in fact, you don't need much more than three hands and a moon. And back in 1999, with the homage à Emil Lange, à Lange und Zona treated us to 150 pieces in honor of the 150th birthday of F.A. Lange's son, Emil Lange. He lived from 1849 to 1922, and this watch is a tribute to his life. This is a truly traditional men's dress watch. 35.9 millimeters with an exquisite combination of applique white gold forming the cosmos with the moon phase executed in solid gold and the dipper connected out of those white gold cabochon applique. You can see there's only one Arabic numeral at 12 with alternating stars and circular cabochon indices. This is a sensational watch. On the case back, a sensational movement with jewels set in chaton, three-quarter bridge, hand engraved balance half bridge, and of course that same German silver material we just saw with glasshuta stripes. This is a gorgeous little giant, and I do mean little giant. 35.9 in the 21st century is a smaller men's watch. But let me show you the kind of wrist presence that this little monster has. This is a watch with panache that belies its size. 
and that's on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist anyone can wear that watch if you want true mid-century dress watch elegance and no compromise one of the greatest ever longa limited editions and still revered by collectors this is the homage a emma longa 150 pieces in platinum 36 millimeters never looked so big and I mean big of heart, big of character, big of charm. This is a watch that's all about persona. Some folks, however, prefer to remember the middle of the 20th century in a somewhat grander scale. The original Geological Geophysic E168 of 1958, the geophysical year, was a 35mm watch. Well, in 2014, it came back, courtesy of the tribute to geophysic, and this, in 800 pieces, was the steel model. It is a very true homage to the original, whereas the original was 35, this is 38.5, but proportionally, it's exactly the same. Now, the thing about this watch, and I'm going to remove the smudges that besmirch its profile. The thing about this watch is that in terms of dial to bezel, bezel to case thickness, case profile to lug, it's proportionally identical to the original, so it reads as the same on the wrist. You can also see how the original's crystal mounted loom dots were relocated to the inner bezel. You can just see that. When you look at the bezel, the inner bezel of the watch, you can see the dots of loom. The original featured radium located under the crystal. That was just too fragile. First of all, it's too radioactive and too fragile for modern purposes. So this will stay anchored to the inner bezel when the watch is serviced. You have the crosshair dial, which was only fitted to the minority of the original geophysics in 1958, but as the more distinctive, memorable, and attractive dial, it became the primary dial on all but the 58 platinum pieces for the tribute to geophysic. Now, what does this little giant offer? Well, it's got a few tricks up its sleeve, starting with the fact that this dress style watch is like the original, a true sports watch, 100 meters water resistant with a Milgauss style soft iron inner cage so it's robustly anti-magnetic and it alone receives a special master control 1000 hours test to no worse than minus one plus four seconds per day and that is by far the most stringent test that JLC applies to any of its watches in the master 1000 hours control and far more precise than a Swiss chronometer has to be to get a certification. Throw that one on the wrist and you can see there is a difference between 38.5 and 35.9. This has a fuller form on the wrist and I think those who are truly tree trunk of forearm are probably going to prefer the slightly larger vintage homage rather than the true vintage size of the Emma Lunga. And I can see right here, lots of friends joining in. Guys, I'm going to do my best to interact with the chat box tonight. I apologize for the fact that I wasn't able to interact much yesterday during our show. I do regret that, and I'm going to try to make amends. So I can see we got some comments. The guy on Watchfinder Co. is also excellent. That's a fact. I'm a fan. He does good work. Oops. Zoomed in on the chat box right there. Claudio is in the chat box, and so is Jason. They're helping out with prices tonight. If you guys have questions, they've got answers. And I can see Abdul from Germany is greeting me from the snowy black forest over in Deutschland. And speaking of Deutschland, let's see, do I have any more German watches on the table? Not oh, other than I have my Zinn EZM 1.1. I may as well throw that out. I know that Abdul is a Zinn owner, so. Takes one to no one, 43 millimeters, 500 pieces, and I banged it into a door frame before the show. As you can see, it is no worse for wear, not even a scratch on that case blank. Tegament, it works. All right, now let's talk about a dress watch that is deceptively simple. I'm gonna start with the case back of this one because it's the dial that's gonna zing you, and that's saying something, considering the Laurent Ferrier FBN 229-1 is a sensation, micro rotor. 35 joule, entirely hand finished in the, can we, let's see, can we do a little bit better on focus? Yeah, we got the focus and now I'm gonna remove my fingerprints. This is a movement that for all intents and purposes, takes the likes of Patek Philippe and Vacheron to school. I don't think you consistently get more than five interior angles on a VC or Patek movement, but Laurent Ferrier gives you four inside the skeletonized balance bridge, a fifth at the center of the caliper. And you'll note that 
The balance bridge is black polished. So are all the screws. So is the bridge for the rotor. It's a micro rotor automatic with a three day power reserve. And you can see how richly grained those Cote de Genève are. That is a different type of Cote de Genève than we've seen so far. Those are laid down with an abrasive wheel and you can see how they're dark on one side. The cresting varies from side to side because they are not stamped. They are laid down the old fashioned way with an abrasive wheel that runs down across the bridges. Now, what do you get? You get a double direct impulse unlubricated escapement. So this uses a wristwatch adaptation of the Brigade natural escapement concept and it works a charm. I've timed these running one second a day. And yes, this is the British Racing Green. This is the Galley Micro Rotor Montre Ecole the school watch, British Racing Green, a series of 10 created in conjunction with the London Craft Fair for 2018. It's a green gloss lacquer dial with white gold applique indices, white gold hands, railroad minutes outboard, and a sunken silvered seconds register at six. 40 millimeters in stainless steel. Here you're paying for the dial and the horology, not for precious metal. I appreciate that Laurent Ferrier makes a large number of watches in steel, including some fairly august pieces. Now this watch features the British racing green dial and a Napa leather calfskin strap. The two designed to evoke mid-century motorsports. First of the type is exemplified by the Aston Martin and Jaguar factory racing teams of the 1950s and 60s, but also a reference to Laurent Ferrier, the watchmaker's own motor racing acumen. He actually placed in his class on the podium at Le Mans. He was an accomplished racing driver during the 1970s, during his days at Patek, time well spent. And by the way, I did a comparison between a Laurent Ferrier Galley Micro Rotor and a Chronomet Bleu from F. Prigion. I narrowly picked the Jorn. If it had been this against the Chronomet Bleu, it would have been this 10 times out of 10. My friends, what do we have right here? JBO Surf saying that is an amazing one. Abdul is saying that is one of the best dress watches to get at the moment. I agree, Pilot Style is a fan. And Matt Foster, one of my favorite Laurent Ferrier, that and the annual calendar. Ray Bonafont saying I love what Laurent Ferrier is doing. And Dr. Phaedra saying a fun dial Laurent. You'd be surprised how many fun dials they do. I'm gonna have to bring an array of them on the show one night. But we, we've seen everything from gold to blue to British racing green to ruthenium gray they they have a sense of humor about them in geneva and finally claudio saying another graduate from the school of patek philippe that's right rejep rejepi roger dubuis laurent ferrier all from patek enough yak let's get back to watches and i can't think of a better way to transition from that discussion than patek philippe itself with the great and glorious grand complication 5016 g in white gold made in perhaps 200, maybe 220 pieces from 1993 to 2011. This, along with the Destrero Scafusia from IWC, was the ultimate wristwatch of the 1990s. Made from 93 to 2011, it was rarely offered. 504 pieces on the caliber, and tourbillon, minute repeater, perpetual calendar with retrograde, with moon phase. It's all of that, and it's all of that in a 36.8 millimeter case. Now, you're going to have to hear it because it's a minute repeater, but then you're also going to have to see it because the black polished strikers are gloriously visible on the case back. First, let's hear it. I have the best job in the world or what? I do this for a living. I do this for a living every week. Okay, let's fire it up for the camera now. You're going to see what this looks like as the strikers are applying their business on the case back. Hopefully it hasn't rolled past 1259 just yet.
and you can see the governor grinding to a halt underneath the Calatrava cross. That's the system that actually paces it. You'll note, because I've had a couple of different minute repeaters on the show for the last couple of weeks, how much more rapid the cadence, that is the speed of the Patek repeater is. Also, note that extraordinary 14 karat gold octopus style third wheel of the movement. That by itself takes 9 to 11 hours to hand finish. 504 pieces in this movement. This was, in my opinion, the greatest watch of the 90s. And again, wrist shot. This is the kind of watch that can disappear in an office full of submariners. A tiny dress watch disappearing under the cuff. A brand most folks don't know. A model almost no folks know. This is stealth wealth at its best. And at about 580,000, it will take some wealth. But thanks to this video, you can replay it as many times as you like. All right, folks, right now, Tim saying, Peter is saying, Vincero watches are the best dress watches made today. Fact. And Youssef joining us from Egypt. Welcome from Egypt. Folks in Europe and the Middle East who are staying up late to watch this show. I appreciate that. And bump, 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 Nolan Reed saying, okay, I had no idea it was a reasonable size. Good Lord. That watch has everything going for it. Okay, now, warning. Parental guidance suggested. This may lead to blows. <sighs> Two watches. One of these things is like the other, and that's the problem. Hey, that guy robbed me. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I have hacking seconds. Ah! Shut up, shut up, shut up. Yes, it's true. The 2016 Piaget Polo S Automatic and the watch that, well, it, shall we say, honors with homage. I don't think homage watches are supposed to happen between brands in the same era. It's generally supposed to be one brand paying tribute to its past. Well, in 2016, Piaget ruffled some feathers with a, a Noquinot? I, I don't quite know what to call it. It's a fun watch and priced right at about 7,000 pre-owned, but there's no denying the non-family resemblance here. I will give credit. Piaget made a watch that's 100 meters water resistant, visible day or night. You can swim with it, you can roughhouse with it, it is tougher in construction and in constitution than the Aquanaut. But, my goodness, <laughs> you, you, only the Swiss could get away with doing this to each other. Now, let me know, what do you guys think? For one-seventh the price of a pre-owned Nautilus, is the Piaget a good deal? Because this pre-owned Nautilus, although it sells for $29.8 new, now costs as much as seven of these Piaget Polo S's. And here's the thing, the Piaget Polo S is a really nice watch. First, it's a good-looking piece that's not too big and not too small. At 42 millimeters on the wrist and only 9.4 millimeters thick, this is an easy one to wear on a small wrist. It's nice and flat. It has a bracelet that, well, like the watch itself, clearly draws heavily on the source material, but the bracelet's also sturdier than the one on the Aquanaut, and unlike the semi-rigid bracelet on the Aquanaut, this one pulls straight down around the wrist and it has no danger of crimping. Moreover, the Piaget movement, the 1100p. It's a good-looking movement. It's not finished like the Patek, but it is a good-looking caliber. You certainly get that for which you've paid. And compared to a solid case-back Rolex and the same price point, you're getting quite a bit of fascinating horology in there. This is actually the Cartier MC1904 doing business as the more finely finished Piaget 1100p. So you guys, or I should say 11... 1110p. It's the 1110p. Now the watch is 100 meters water resistant, brightly loomed. It does feature hacking seconds. It does feature a quick set date, and it does feature a lot of borrowed design language from this guy right here. Now here's the original. This would be my choice. Cost no object. But again, you're paying seven times as much for this. I would say if you're a Nautilus owner, get the Piaget and make that the watch you wear when you wash the dog, when you go out to the beach, when you're in the pool. Make that the watch that takes the hard miles, and this perhaps the one that is, is more of your cream puff. I'm not saying this isn't a sports watch, but the Piaget has a tougher movement, a tougher bracelet, and a tougher case. It's tougher overall. There is room in the same watch collection and alternating on the same wrist for both of these watches. Right here, bump, 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 bump. So I see a... Um, Matt Foster saying, just can't get behind the Piaget. And Ryan saying, the Piaget looks more Aquanaut on bracelet. That's true. The Piaget's bracelet does look a lot more like the rarely seen Aquanaut bracelet. I, I, 
I call it the, I mean, it seems like the Nauquinaut. It's got bits of Aquanaut and Nautilus kind of spliced. I mean, gene, gene engineering, it, it has a dark side, and that's part of it. Right here I can see Abdul saying the Piaget used a traditional Swiss design technique called copy-paste. It's a good deal pre-owned, and I'm going to agree with that. And McLaren855 saying Nautilus is so un -patek. It may be just me, but I don't see why people are crazy about the Nautilus. You know what? There's something to be said for that. And right here I can see Sabrell Mark 42 joining at 1124 in Glasgow, Scotland. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I can see Cassidy joining us from Harrisburg, and he's planning to attend Lidditz. Let me know how that goes. All right, jumping on, we've got a little bit of time left. Fortunately, I've also got a Rescence on the table, and that is always good fun. Now, I don't know how many of you watched my Rescence Type 3 video over the last 48 hours, but thank you, that has become my most viewed video ever in 48 hours. I don't know how it happened. Please, if you found that video, let me know how, because I don't know how a video overnight suddenly does 40,000 views when my other Resins videos have like two or three. But hey, fuel on the fire, Resins Type 1 Squared RS. So in 2017, Resins' Type 1 came in a new square case, 41 millimeters by 41. It's got a little bit of wire lug Panerai Rodiumir in it, but it's also got a heck of a lot of Rescence in it, which means the regulator display with the ROCS orbital convex system rotates as a whole as each individual display, hours, minutes, seconds, and the day rotates independently. So it's like the solar system. Every planet is spinning even as they rotate the sun. Now, this is a fully loomed watch and sensational at night, but by day, you'll note the dark metallic industrial ruthenium finish and note that each register has its own concentric circular graining and the outside has a separate macro graining. Turn it all over and you can see the real innovation of the Type 1S. This is a lever that finally lets you get a grip quite literally, on the Resence case back, which is used for winding when you wind it manually, as well as setting of everything from the hours, minutes, and seconds to the day. And yes, the watch does have a day display. It's right here. You can see the hollow swoops of that display are actually the weekend. Now, this is a slim one, 11.5 millimeters. It's not one of the oil-filled watches, and as a result, it costs about half as much as the oil-filled watches. 2824 base, so it's tank tough. The module is built entirely by Resence in Switzerland. 15 jewels, 107 pieces. It's the best of both worlds. Unbreakable automatic caliber in the base and manufacture watchmaking for the distinctive added value on top. And it is a slim watch, 41 by 41, it wears that way. This is a great modern high horology watch, independent horology watch, independent watchmaking special interest watch from a brand that makes four to 500 watches a year, and yet it is everyday reliable. This is as tough as any Omega or Rolex, and it'll slide under a cuff. But sometimes even a $20,000 watch is asking too much, and we can have our fun for a whole lot less, and we will. For $1,200 to $1,400, a pre-owned Oris Diver 65 steel bronze is exactly the ticket. One of the hottest watches of Basel World 2018 and one of the most affordable. This is a 40 millimeter watch that does two-tone right. The golden bezel is anything but, it's bronze, and the dial features creamy, simulated Ecru Patina Luminova that has no loss of luminescence at night, as well as rose gold plated indices, so you have those consonant tones as well as gilt style printing on the dial. This is an incredibly handsome watch that has a simulated rivet style vintage form bracelet, and my favorite single feature, the part that Oris just got right, the narrow 1960s diver case band, without which this watch simply would not be an authentic homage. This truly recreates the vintage look. That, along with the dramatically bubble-shaped sapphire that simulates a plexiglass with none of the plexiglass vulnerabilities. Now, I'm going to throw this on the wrist. It actually features a trigger clasp, which is more deluxe than I expected. Again, this is a watch with a trigger clasp, a full bracelet, and real light-duty diver capability. It's 100 meters water-resistant with screw-down crown unidirectional bezel. All of this you can pick up for just over $1,200. That's a hell of a lot of value. And it's another reason why I think Oris is one of the most honest values and most honest brands, period, in the business. They price the watch according to what it actually costs to make it.
I can't say that the watch is notably less refined or less finely finished than a Breitling that would cost over $5,000. And that's the miracle of Oris. It's even 13 millimeters thick. Oris, you continue to amaze me. All right, we got three watches left in our program. We're gonna go two up right here. Watches that I consider to be in-house rivals. This is a sibling rivalry of the finest kind. On the right of your screen, you can see the 2018 Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, 42 millimeters now in stainless steel with a ceramic bezel that actually has white enamel inlays. The dial is now laser etched and made of ceramic. And for the first time ever on the Diver 300 meter general production model, Model, not a Bond limited edition, but the series production, you have a display case back so you can see the 55 hour master chronometer coaxial caliber 8800. So this watch, 42 millimeters, 50 millimeters lug to lug, but here's the thing, the 39.5 millimeter Planet Ocean costs almost exactly the same amount of money pre-owned. They're both going to be about $4,000. Now this watch has white gold indices, white gold numerals, white gold hands. It has a more deluxe case construction that's 600 meters rather than 300. It's equipped with a hybrid leather and rubber strap, and it has its full clasp attached rather than the pin buckle of the Diver 300. But here's the question. Given that I will attest to both of these watches wearing the same size on the wrist, the 42 Diver 300 wears like the 39.5 Planet Ocean. Which one would you want if you knew that they have the exact same caliber 8800 inside? Let's do a quick wrist shot. That's the 39.5 Planet Ocean. This is a watch that's $6,450 new. The Diver 300 is $4,750 new. Both of them are gonna be just over 4,000 pre-owned. So that's on my 16 centimeter wrist, 39.5 Planet Ocean. Now, Diver 300, on the wrist, it's a flatter watch. Instead of 14.4 millimeters, it's 13.7. It's also a much broader watch. And for the first time on this watch, not that you'll ever use it, and I certainly won't, but the helium escape valve, now shaped like a Reese's peanut butter cup, can be opened underwater without hazard to the watch. I have to say, all things considered, this is my choice, with no looking back. The Planet Ocean needs to raise its game. Omega, you've got a sibling rivalry of the roughest kind. Blows have been traded, bruises accrued. It's time for the Planet Ocean to fire back. And finally, because sports watches can also be patricians, and because we already ran through our Nautilus and Piaget content for the evening, let's conclude with a beauty from Vacheron Constantin, the late, great, second-generation overseas chronograph. This is the 49150 in red gold, brown bronze dial, rose gold garnishings about the hands, the chapter rings, the Maltese cross motif bezel, flanking a dial with a beautifully dished chapter ring and a metallic tinge that explodes in the light. This is a timepiece, 42 millimeters, 150 meters water resistant. It is a true sports watch. It has an anti-magnetic soft iron inner cage. It has a high horology movement inside from Frédéric Piguet. This is an all-timer, and right now, with the Generation 3 overseas finally picking up steam and becoming hot, this is an underrated buy now opportunity. If you want all the style, all the cachet, and none of the baggage of a Nautilus. This is the answer right here. And this has the size and the wrist presence to be an alternative to an offshore as well as a Nautilus. This can battle the Nautilus, the Aquanaut, the Royal Oak, and the offshore all at once. This is a street fighter right here. And that street, of course, is going to be Fifth Avenue, New York. But the bottom line is this is one hell of a timepiece. Oof. Also suitable for the Sunset Strip. Friends, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you all joining in. Claudio, Gary Smith, Jason helping attend the chat box. Hadi Youssef, Phil B, Xavier, Bob Rulo, Chip Wong, JBO Sir from Adelaide, Andre Andre, all my friends. The party continues tonight on Instagram. Tim underscore Masso, join me. We have a new following and a new type of video. My um, new 60 second videos are the rule. Every single post on my Instagram is gonna be a short form review. The fun continues there after the show. Thank you so much, thanks to you, thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.